Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. Smallpox, the bubonic plague, the Spanish flu. Those are some of the many diseases that have changed the course of history over the last few thousand years. Here's a new one bound for the DSM, Trump derangement syndrome. It's a particularly insidious illness because it doesn't merely affect individuals, but entire political parties, rendering them unrecognizable. Until about 20 minutes ago, for example, the Democrats saw themselves as the party of reason resistant to superstition and mass hysteria. They were, as they often told you, the party that fought McCarthyism. Now it's the party that engages in McCarthyism enthusiastically. Watch. This is nothing short of treasonous because it is a betrayal of the nation. He is giving aid and comfort to the enemy. I think Donald Trump is a fascist. I think everything he stands for is disgusting. That is pure racism. And the president is cynically using that racism to appeal to his base. That is not what you see in a democracy. That is exactly what you see in authoritarian regimes. They dare me to say impeach him. Today I say impeach 45. Speaking of hysteria, Maxine Waters, of course, did not stop there. She urged her followers to hunt down and harass anybody tied to the Trump administration. If you see anybody from that cabinet in a restaurant, in a department store, at a gasoline station, you get out and you create a crowd. And you push back on them. And you tell them they're not welcome. Oh, and they obeyed. And as a result, this happened. This is all rage by proxy, of course. They'd like to hurt Trump himself, but he's not around, so they attack his employees and supporters. And in the absence of any of those, a star on the sidewalk with his name on it. Watch this. That's how it started, but smashing the star did not cool the emotions of the star smashers. Now the star is a venue for street fights. I don't give a f what, what you gonna do? Get out of my We're deep in here. We're deep right here. Get out of my face. We're deep right here. Get out of my face. 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 Hey, 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 hey. Hear that? What you haven't heard are Democratic leaders appealing for calm. The Democratic Party at this point has become totally unmoored from whatever principles once defined it. Under Franklin Roosevelt, Democrats championed working Americans and organized labor. They couldn't do that today. Too many union members are middle-aged white guys. Instead, their only remaining principle is hatred of the president. If Trump supports something, they're against it. If he's against it, they're huge fans, no matter what it is. Consider the events of the past few months. MS-13, for example, a deadly street gang that engages in sex trafficking, rape, drug smuggling, torture, murder with knives. MS-13 preys on poor people, mostly immigrants. The president called them animals because they are. Within hours, the left produced a wave of speeches and op-eds extolling the basic human dignity of gang members with face tattoos whose model is kill, rape, control. Once they embraced MS-13, the left decided that the law enforcement agency charged with arresting MS-13 must be bad. Hence the now common demand that ICE be abolished so that immigration laws can never again be enforced. And then there's Stormy Daniels. Even on the far left, hardcore pornography was not considered an ideal career for your daughter. And then Daniels and her creepy cable-friendly lawyer emerged. And now Daniels is touted on the left as some sort of civil rights hero. When Rudy Giuliani doubted her credibility, he was blasted for impugning the respectability of women who have sex with strangers on camera for pay. Well, for years, the left was even more adamant than the right in demanding free speech for Americans and good for them. And then came Trump. Free speech allowed Donald Trump and his supporters to be heard, so now the left is against free speech. They're begging Facebook and Twitter to suppress the opinions they dislike and censor news outlets that don't toe the new Democratic Party line the line that has existed for about 15 minutes. The left also used to worry about the unchecked power of the most powerful sectors of our government, the CIA and the FBI and the whole constellation of alphabet agencies. They worried that those bureaucrats might violate civil liberties at will. They might spy on Americans. They might hide all of that. 
How about this one? For decades, the left accused the rich of not paying their fair share of taxes. Okay. Last year's tax reform bill rolled back the amount of state and local taxes rich people can deduct. Now that the wealthy, though, form the core of the Democratic Party's constituency, liberals are outraged by this. New York and New Jersey are suing the Trump administration to get the rich their tax deductions back. We could go on and on and on. George W. Bush embroiled America in a ruinous Middle Eastern war. The left hated him for that. Now he gave a speech criticizing Trump last year, so he's fully rehabilitated. The left used to fear corporate control of major news outlets, and they should. But after President Trump attacked the Washington Post as a mouthpiece for Amazon mogul Jeff Bezos, a USA Today columnist said those critiques were, quote, attacks on the First Amendment, as if they defend the First Amendment. They don't. President Trump tweeted threats at Kim Jong-un, so his sister was praised at the Winter Olympics for stealing the spotlight from Vice President Pence. She must be great. The president hates her brother. President Trump wants better relations with Russia and peace in Syria. So naturally, all the geniuses in Washington tell us we have to prepare for war. So naturally, all the geniuses in Washington tell us we have to prepare for war against both countries. To anyone who remembers the Democrats of the 1960s, the 90s, or even three years ago, it's all very confusing. That party is dead. It's been replaced by a new one whose entire platform could be say no to Trump. This isn't politics anymore. It's the world's dumbest religion. Tammy Bruce is a New York radio host, and she joins us tonight. How easy is the left to control that the president, whatever he says they oppose, I mean, he could oppose something that 99% of Americans are against, so the Democratic Party would be for it. Yes, exactly. Great to be on set with you. Nice to see you, Tammy. Nice to see you, too. Look, this is, in a, in a way, it's, it's kind of strange and funny. We've accused the left of having Trump derangement syndrome as a mocking example of the fact that they just simply need to grow up. That this is something that is just this inability of people to acknowledge and to deal with a, a, a real life adult event that they lost an election. And now there's an effort to normalize being so uh, damaged, if you will, by an external event that some U.S. psychiatrists now are saying they've got more patience with tr uh, Trump anxiety uh, disorder. Uh, of course, none of that is really true or genuine. It is about people needing to grow up and deal with reality properly. But in the process, as you note, they, as liberals, are giving the president an enormous amount of control. Their lives and every moment of how they react to him is based on what he says what he does. They have virtually, they've, they've acceded complete control to him. If they step back for a moment and just realize that they could have some influence, that, that they could work in a dynamic to get their uh, policies, their narrative, their, poli their, their preferences passed, uh, maybe they would have some success. But now you've got leadership, as you played in, in the opening, encouraging this refusal to deal with reality, encouraging this dynamic uh, that plays on effectively. It's almost an abusive dynamic, but it comes down to individual Americans deciding that they're going to uh, be children at this point and it, be angry it's so perpetually. weird. I mean, it's literally reactionary in literally. that they are reacting purely to him. Exactly. But I'm not sure I even really understand it. I think Trump is interesting, I guess. He's a politician. Sure. They're, they find him the most fascinating person who's ever lived. There's nothing that Trump says or does that they don't obsess over. They're like stalkers. What about him drives them so bonkers? And, and especially since the things that he does has improved everyone's lives. There is no doubt about that. ISIS is dead. MS-13 is being dealt with. Everybody's got more money in their pocket. The job uh, uh, economy is, is at historical lows. The job, uh, the unemployment rate. There is no one who hasn't benefited from this, except, of course, ISIS and MS-13. Uh, what, what is it about him? That he's everything they thought couldn't exist. They had this idea. They were told certain things by their leadership of how it was going to be. And as a result, since everyone thought that it was going to be a certain way and they were promised certain things, Donald Trump represents the fact that the future may be isn't controlled by them, that there is a different thing that can happen, and they're being encouraged by Democratic leadership to see this in a personal way, in exclusively an emotional way, in the most extreme fashion, appealing to the fringe. I can tell you, and I've said this uh, before, uh, uh, that maybe we're not as divided as they say we are, that a majority of Democrats also agree with the benefit that the president is bringing us. Democrats are walking away from the party, that there is this shift in what's happening, and Democrat leadership simply was not prepared for this, and they feel that um, uh, uh, harassment 
of people who don't think like them is the easiest and best thing to do. So they're, they're failing, so they're hysterical. I just find it's an amazing moment. Tammy Bruce, yeah. great to see you. Thanks, Thank thanks you for very having much. me. Pleasure to be here. Richard Goodstein is a lawyer. He advised Hillary Clinton's presidential campaigns. He joins us tonight. Richard, I never thought I would see a moment where Democrats are angry because a Republican has raised taxes on the rich. I never thought that would happen. And it's a measure, I mean, if there's one sort of core idea in the Democratic Party, it's the rich don't pay enough. So here, the Trump tax bill makes them pay more in certain places on the East Coast, in New York and New Jersey, and they're suing him for it. How does that work exactly? Well, I think the core Democratic value is social and economic justice. And I think the feeling that most of these tax cuts went to corporations, and the evidence is pretty clear at this point, A, it's unpopular, the tax bill that passed, and B, it's not working. Most people's, the wages are flat in no, this country. That's and, not what and they're suing over. But, but, but hold on, that's not what they're suing over. I mean, so Andrew Cuomo, who you'd have to think is one of the front runners for the Democratic nomination mm -hmm. 2020, I he's agree. not a minor figure in the Democratic Party. He's suing because Trump signed a bill that raises taxes on the rich doesn't allow the deductions from the federal tax form on state taxes and that only affects rich people and he's outraged by that did you think that you would live to be old enough to see that a standard bearer of progressive values angry that the rich are getting soaked seriously yeah so the the, the truth is that again what the tax bill did was go after blue state uh, wealthy people, right? That, that's what it did. Invariably, it hits states like New York and New Jersey and California well, it has and st others. states with high the property taxes. But but hold on. But the fact remains: the Democrats are arguing that the rich pay too much in taxes in their state. I mean, maybe they do. I mean, whatever. I'm not a liberal, so I mean, I can kind of see the wisdom in that argument. But yeah. it suggests that whatever Trump is for, they're against. And that's not really a good way to chart your course as a political yeah. party, is it? I think that's actually a distortion. What Democrats, a distortion. had they been in charge of Congress, would have passed legislation that would have indeed lowered tax rates for m middle class and most uh, wage owners, and probably would have either increased or kept st uh, current the rates for wealthy people. That's what Democrats would have done. Okay, instead. so Trump raised taxes on the rich and the Democrats are mad. Look, I mean, I'm not criticizing him for that. I get it. It's just, it's just, you're not acknowledging no, how actually, weird overall, this moment is. Yeah, it's very I think weird. Overall, talk to your friends. You're in New York now. Go up and down Wall Street and ask them whether they're paying higher or lower taxes. I think the answer is, notwithstanding the state and local tax deduction issue, most of them got a right. huge tax benefit well, out of this all, bill. Well, they're all Democratic voters, as, as you know, the rich vote Democrat now. Well, did you ever think you'd see a moment where the Democratic Party defended the dignity of hardcore pornography? When Rudy Giuliani impugned the character of Stormy Daniels, who has sex with strangers on camera, the left almost unanimously said, whoa, there's nothing wrong with that. Did you ever think we'd get to that point? I mean, what is I'm that? Is there a huge constituency of porn workers that you guys uh, are trying to suck up to? Or like, what is that about? I never thought we'd see a president on Air Force One deny something when he's asked a question about Stormy Daniels or Karen McDougal, and his lawyer admitted that he was lying. I never actually did think we no, would see that. No, that's I true. That. That, that was a wild yeah. moment. I, I agree. But it didn't speak to the principle of an entire party. I just didn't, I didn't, I mean, is there a big constituency that thinks that pornographic actors don't get the respect they're due? Is that why Democrats are defending? Or what about MS-13? Is, is there a big MS-13 constituency? They're like, you know what? we got to shore up the base with the MS-13 voters. Uh, like, why are they defending no MS-13? Any idea? There's no constituency for tearing babies from mothers. Uh -huh. I guarantee you both parties agree on that, right? Except for somebody in the White House and people who work for him. Tearing directly. babies from mothers. Yeah. Okay. Well, really, it happens to, they're never going to really, see them again. Because it happens to American citizens every single day, but nobody well, cares. Because, oh, they're boring American citizens. Every American with children, it's half of all federal prisoners, is separated from his kids, but nobody cares because they're not illegal aliens. So, like, who cares? They're just stupid Americans who voted for Trump. Like, no big deal. Where's the outrage for that? Any idea? These people were getting traumatized in Central America. They come up looking for asylum. Oh, and so, but, but what about in Utica? And they will what, never see them again. What about Youngstown? Do we not care about those people? They're not getting traumatized because they're separated from their kids by force. Men no. with guns separate from their children. Nobody cares because they're Americans, dummies. Yeah. They voted for Trump, right? Well, I, I think people who go to jail, uh, they, they've made choices that are different from the person oh, trying to escape who persecution snuck into our in country Central illegally. America. They didn't make a choice by violating our immigration law. That was mandatory, I guess. Yeah, I, I, again, I think we're talking about two different things. <laughs> we are talking about, we are, I'm talking about Americans, are. you're talking about foreigners who break our law. Uh, uh, well, I'm, I'm talking about people who, sh who have a, you know, the U.S. used to be sympathetic to people like this, and we're not anymore. We should be sympathetic to Americans, away. I would say. Richard, great to see you. Thank you My very pleasure. much. Thank you.
President Trump promised to build a wall on the border and carried the Republican to Party to victory two years ago on that promise. Remember that? Elections are supposed to have consequences. This election didn't have a consequence, though, for congressional Republicans. They're still refusing to pay for the wall. Why is that? Lou Dobbs may have an answer. He joins us next from New York. We are going to build a great border wall to stop illegal immigration. I would build a great wall, and nobody builds walls better than me, believe me. I'm going to stop illegal immigration and drugs coming into our country, and yes, we will build the wall. We could spend the whole show playing those clips. It was the one thing Donald Trump was perfectly clear about as he campaigned for president. If elected, he would build a border wall on our southern border. On the strength of that promise, above all other promises, he beat 16 other Republican candidates, upset Hillary Clinton, and the Republican Party unexpectedly kept both houses of Congress. Where's the wall, by the way? Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell's position is, thanks for the votes, the wall, maybe later. Is the funding of the border wall going to wait until after the midterm elections? Probably, and that's something we do have a disagreement on. And So uh, Homeland Security won't get funded before the midterms? Probably not. Yeah, probably not. Because there's a disagreement. But there's some consensus, too, on the Republican side. Republicans have been able to pursue tons of other priorities. They passed the largest corporate tax cut in history, expanded the H-2B foreign worker program. So who exactly is the Republican Party representing? Voters or a handful of donors? We think you know. Lou Dobbs has spent years thinking about this. He hopes lose Lou Dobbs tonight on Fox Business. He joins us tonight. Um, I, I'm kind of speechless to this. Well, that's the problem. One becomes, I mean, all of this becomes ineffable to describe, to accept, uh, and to deal with because it is so obviously toxic and corrosive. Uh, there are so many sellouts. You know that the Republican leadership in the House and the Senate are made up of uh, simply, uh, you know, acolytes of uh, expediency and, of course, corporate America, the U.S. multinationals uh, and the Koch brothers, Wall Street, uh, Business Roundtable and the Chamber of Commerce. And by the time you get through, there's no room for the American people, just 300 million of us. There's no room uh, for the middle class, working men and women and their families. That's why President Trump got elected. The American people's sense the uh, inordinate power uh, and corruption of the establishment, and that's why this anti-establishment president, anti president was elected. But they're proving the point. So a lot of people voted for Trump because they thought, this isn't a democracy, it's an oligarchy, stop lying to me. Mm -hmm. And now they're proving that it's true. I mean, in a democracy, you would look and say, what's the thing that voters voted for in the last election? Let's try and do it. They're not even trying. Yeah, it, it, they're not trying, and they're doing it rather snootily, I think, as well. I mean, probably not. Dismissive, superior, and oh, by the way, don't even pretend that you belong in the same room as me. Oh, oh and washed, says Mitch McConnell. Uh, and Paul Ryan, he's, he's talking about a better way agenda to compete, when in fact what they're both saying is we're going to do exactly what Charles Koch says. We're going to keep open borders. We're going to bring across as many illegal immigrants as possible. The middle class be damned, the working man and woman in this country be damned, America be damned. They're not going, even though they've styled it as such, a going against Trump. They're going against this country in our most precious values and all that has made us great. And that's our middle class. So why would people, I mean, apart from the fact the Democratic Party has actually gone off the deep end and is right. dangerous, leaving that aside, why would anybody vote for Republicans right now? Right now, there's only one reason. His name's Donald J. Trump. He's the man who won the election. He is the reason the Republicans retained the House and the, and, and the Senate. And there is no other explanation. And these fools, these fools leading the House and the Senate. Tucker, they really have decided that they can do this without Donald Trump. They don't have to affix themselves to the Trump agenda. They don't have to talk about deregulation. They don't have to look at all that he has achieved. This is already a, an historic president in a year, just over a year and a half, uh, in office. It's remarkable. But the second they get crushed, assuming, let's say the Republicans lose the House. Yes, as they will, likely will if they leave particularly Ryan in place. But they're going to blame Trump. Of course they will. That's the game. And uh, the American people, though, will know the reason. There's a party that's not worthy of their support, not worthy of their uh, trust. There is a president, 
And this is going to be the great divide because we are watching oligarchs like the Koch brothers carry out class warfare. Think of this. The Koch brothers, who have been synonymous with the Republican Party, are conducting class warfare against the middle class, the foundation of the country, working men and women, and saying, the hell with you, we can bring in illegal immigrants. We're going to arbitrage labor costs just as we've been doing around the world. Lou Dobbs, not a word mincer. No, sir. Great to see you. Great to see you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Philadelphia's mayor is putting his citizens at risk for the sake of protecting criminals in the city. That's next, live from New York. Stay tuned. The mayor of Philadelphia has decided that protecting illegal aliens is worth putting his city's citizens at risk. The Preliminary Arraignment Reporting System, or PARS, is a collaboration between ICE and local governments that ICE uses to track when illegal immigrants have been arrested for crimes. But now Mayor Jim Kenney is kowtowing to activists and ending Philadelphia's PARS agreement with ICE for the express purpose of protecting illegal immigrants, even criminal illegals, from capture and deportation. Cesar Vargas is a lawyer and illegal immigrant. He joins us on the set tonight. Cesar, thank you for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. So tell me why the mayor of Philadelphia is working to protect foreign nationals accused of crimes, but not American citizens. How does this help the American citizens of Philadelphia? Well, to talk about democracy, the people of Philadelphia elected the mayor people who were either born here or are U.S. citizens supported the mayor and still support the mayor's decision to abolish ICE, uh, the ability to cut that tie between ICE. So this is the, pe the wishes of the of Philadelphia. So you're and saying, not, wait, hold on, whoa, whoa, whoa. So by that, okay, so you're saying that any elected official, because he was elected, by definition, all of his decisions have the support of the people. So by that standard, Donald Trump his position on illegal immigration is the will of the people of the United States. So how dare you question that? Well, there's difference, right? We have the oh, electoral college a and, the pop and the popular vote. No, no, no. Donald was, Trump on, he was won elected. by technicality, and you want to kind of say by the hold by on, Russian. Hold on, let me, let, let me just so say. Hold on, we we slow, down, slow down. On As that. an American, let me explain our system to you. I know that you're here illegally. As an American, I will tell you that he won under the rules that we have that were set out in our founding documents. Now, you may not like them, but those were the rules. So he is our democratically elected president. And your point now is that once you're elected, no one can complain about what you do because, as you put it, democracy. And so, you have the right to complain. And I think everyone has the okay. right to so challenge let, let, the let's, let's, let's and okay. I think that's so what So you made a silly is. point. I destroyed it. Let's get to the real meat of this debate, which is like, how actually does it help the citizens, whether they voted for him or not? Well, it's in still, Philadelphia, how does it help allowing criminals to go unpunished or to escape federal law enforcement? How does that benefit the Philadelphians? Well, there's two systems, right? The, the preliminary arraignment reporting system that we just cut tight, right? That essentially prevented ICE from going into the system that, you know, immigration's day-to-day -day interaction. So if they go to a party with a bunch of foolish teenagers and they go call police and they arrest a teenager, that's the system they're going to cut off. Like, ICE doesn't need to get involved in that. The system, if someone gets arrested for a violent crime, they still go through uh, FBI and Department of Homeland Security fingerprints. So violent criminals, people who threaten us harm, will still be going through a system, will still get background, and ICE still has this information. To two separate systems, people of Philadelphia will still be protected. ICE but will less, not target but, but, but less the first teenager oh, or someone so who they, just they won't fight. enforce federal law in Philadelphia. So that's a federal law. By the way, voted for under the system that you lauded when you first sat down, our democracy. People voted for those laws, and you're now saying that it's immoral to enforce them. So I guess I'm the one who believes in democracy, not you. But by your standard, the state of New York has an assault weapons ban. Lots of towns are against that. Should local sheriffs say, I'm not for the ban, I'm not going to refer violators of the ban to the feds or to the state. Would that be okay with you? Well, we already have some, some counties in upstate or across the country who are pushing against gun laws, right? Don't we have... No, people, we, don't have we, any, have, we don't have any we have town. plenty of Hold times no, we where don't. The, your side resists and people... No, no. This we, is democracy, We right? actually... People, People no. resist in terms of the policies that they disagree with. What, and they, that's okay. what they don't do is encourage the violation of law, because that's not democracy, that's anarchy, okay? So you know as well as I that if there was a town in New York that's like, we're just not obeying your gun laws, how's that sound? That you'd be outraged, and I actually wouldn't like it either, because I kind of believe in the law. 
So why is this different? Because one is fashionable and helps the Democratic Party and the other is not, right? Well, listen, I think, you know, when it comes to the resist movement, this is, we have seen this across the country, whether it's Republican or Democrat, whether it's liberal or conservative. Everyone has the right to resist, and that's what democracy is, right? So we're not debating about we're not debating about so fashion not deb- laws. You've, you've, we're we're you've debating of whether or not I should democracy. violate people's constitutional rights, so, and I think that's what's at stake at this moment. Oh, okay. So deporting someone here illegally is violating his constitutional right. That's so insane. I'm not even sure I can. <laughs> I, very quickly, I just want to ask you this. So there are now calls on the left to make health care universal, universal Medicaid. This country is tens of trillions in debt. Should we extend? those benefits to illegal aliens and if so why well, I think it goes to the concept of citizenship, right? As a nation, we have matured from only free uh, landowner white people to now don't hit women me with, to oh, don't hit me with the race right? crap. No, no, okay? no. But we're talking, you know, you we're talking about right. women, right? We're talking As about a citizen of a right? country controlled so by the conquistadors, don't question, lecture me about I believe this not only in healthcare, but I believe that we should open the franchise, the right to vote to everyone, because the unique. Including the, you. The unique power You're here of illegally. American democracy, democracy is not a constitution, but it's the unique experiment that we all, all are equal. That <laughs> is what say, American I democracy say, is all about. You, I don't know what chutzpah is in Spanish, but for you sitting here illegally, and we're not reporting you or having you like taken out by force. And you know, actually, Hold I on. got a green you're, card now. You're and telling. You know that's a whole different Well, you do have a green card. Yeah. Okay. And I didn't do it the ma, right ma, way. Ma, I did it the American problem. way. No, but I that's for a different segment. You're telling me that the essence of our country is not our constitution, it's letting illegals vote. And I have to absolutely. nod and vote about it. Oh, that's absolutely right, Caesar. <laughs> it's, about, it's about us truly embracing that everyone can be as an American. Everyone. Regardless of whether you're born. And, and, and regardless of so no matter where status. you're from, you have a right to come here, vote in our elections, get free stuff. We built this awesome country, and now everyone from around the world just gets to take whatever they want. Because Illegal why? immigrants because built this why? nation, right? No, they Illegal. didn't. No, That's actually, they did didn't. Christopher Columbus have... Uh, citizenship. When well, he didn't abroad. build the country, by the way. Who did? <laughs> Immigrants <laughs> did, right? Right. No, actually, Americans did. And that's the fundamental lie. No, you're not, actually. You're a Mexican citizen, I American. believe. It's right here. A Mexican American. And that's uh-huh. the pride of this great. You know what? You are. You're bold. I will say that. I kind of admire it in a way. Oh, These are great it. to Thank see. Thank you so much for having me again. We finally have the FBI's FISA application targeting Carter Page. Much of it was redacted, it's about 20 pages. What's in those 20 pages? We'll investigate that coming up. Also, Greg Gutfeld is here. Exposed New York Mayor Bill de Blasio's latest disaster. Gutfeld, as a New York resident, very familiar with life under de Blasio. Coming up. Well, thanks to the release of the FBI's FISA application to spy on Carter Page, we know for certain now that the Steele dossier and its unverified contents were in fact used to justify long-term spying on an American citizen. That used to be a big deal in an earlier time like a year ago. The left would be barking about that for good reason. But we still don't know everything about the FISA application. Much of it remains classified. What could be in those pages, the redacted ones, and what might they reveal about the Obama administration spying on the Trump campaign? Tom Fitton is president of Judicial Watch, whose FOIA request is responsible for getting that FISA application released in the first place. He joins us tonight. Tom, first of all, thank you uh, for what you've done with these FOIA requests. Um, They're complicated and expensive, and I'm really glad that you filed that because it gives us a picture of what this spying was about. But it doesn't give us the full picture. What do you think has been redacted and why? Well, I think more corruption has been redacted, more information about uh, dishonesty with the FISA court or things that the Obama uh, administration and, frankly, some of the Trump administration don't want us to see in terms of outrageous political targeting of uh, the Trump campaign and then even President Trump. Because remember, these FISA warrants were used during the Obama administration and signed as recently as uh, June of 2017 by Rod Rosenstein, who uh, presumably used it for the Mueller investigation. So there are a lot of people who don't want to see us, uh, want us to see this full information. And the president needs to intervene directly and declassify this additional material. Devin Nunes, Bob Goodlatte, you name it, say there's nothing classified here. Uh, they're just protecting their own. And uh, if the president's declassification earlier this year, frankly, led to the release of this material through the FOIA process, he should take the next step, release the next set of information, it's only 30 pages or so, and uh, get the full truth out to the American people. 
that's within his power to do. He overrode the deep state earlier this year, and we got this amazing material about the DNC Clinton dossier. He should override their concerns again. I agree completely. We're almost out of time, but just remind us, is protecting the reputation of your agency or hiding your own corruption, those valid reasons to redact information in a document? No, well, frankly, it ought to require uh, the disclosure. Uh, the Justice Department and the FBI need to stop the cover-up. Uh, and using uh, these exemptions, these redactions to protect uh, uh, public disclosure of government corruption is an inappropriate use of those materials yeah. or those uh, privileges. Exactly. And this is why the president needs to step in. These and guys can't be trusted to evaluate the material fairly and disinterestedly. This is why President Trump should act. Yeah, they ought to be fired immediately for that. It's totally un indefensible. Tom, thanks a lot for that. Uh, you're welcome. Most Americans are horrified by what's happening in California. Many are leaving the state. But Bill de Blasio sees California as a model for New York. Greg, Greg Gutfeld lives in New York, amazingly, and joins us next to discuss what's happening here. Stay tuned. California was for many years the golden state. Greg Gutfeld and I are both from there. Now human waste and drug needles are piling up in the streets and regular middle class people are fleeing faster than they can rent rider trucks. It's not a model to imitate unless you are the mayor of New York, Bill de Blasio. He's looking to open new needle exchange sites in New York because the city isn't dirty enough. Frequent TCT guest Chadwick Moore recently tweeted this quote, street feces in New York City is already skyrocketing. We might as well go full San Francisco. Ugh, how's that for depressing? Greg Gutfeld hosts The Greg Gutfeld Show Saturdays at 10 p.m. And, of course, every day, co-host The Five here on Fox. He joins us. Great to see you. Yeah, Street Feces was the name of my band, by the way. <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't or a punk to. polka. You know, it's interesting. This is how Progressive thinks. Uh, New York looks at Los Angeles and thinks... Hold my herbal tea, I can do worse. And so they sit there like uh, de Blasio has already uh, chosen not to arrest people over public urination. So now they technically are the golden state. Okay, that's disgusting, but also amusing and deeply true. Yeah. But also so predictable. So de Blasio takes over, he gets like 15% of the vote or right. something. Nobody votes. Nobody votes. And you look at him and you think, gosh, I hope he's not going to do what liberals did to the city in the 70s. And in six years, he already has. And the reason is, is what, what let's say, uh, San Francisco and Los Angeles and New York have in common are rich, guilty liberals. And, and if you have a lot of rich, guilty liberals, they will allow for any kind of bad decisions, stupid decisions, any kind of socialist ideas, because they can afford it. The other people can't, but they can't. That's why you have this incredible uh, wealth inequality in California. You have the Pelosi estates, and then you have the tent cities you know, underneath. Exactly. The, and and, and, and it, what I love about L.A. is Hollywood creates these dystopian fantasies like The Handmaid's Tale and how evil this is. They don't have to. They All they have to do is look out the window. No, look exactly out the window. Right. It is exactly right, Look Tucker. up the back side of the Hollywood Hills into the valley. By the way, I just destroyed. noticed you have a gum drop. That's not mine. That's Lou Dobbs. That's Lou Dobbs. If Ooh. I could just say, yes, Ooh. it is. I, I, I am e bang this. I hate to... I am eBay. That's this. Look repulsive, at that, huh? and it's in my not pocket, mine. Lou. I've got you, Lou. And I would admit it. I have your work. DNA. I can put this anywhere and implicate him in a crime. Call Mark Furman. <laughs> we now move to the friends. <laughs> we'll talk to our friends here at Fox. Greg Gutfeld is a yes. coming out. Greg, I've read every one of your books over many years, including your unpublished postmodern novels, which were weird, but I yes. still enjoyed them. Yes. This is my favorite one. Really? But yes, because it's nonstop. Yes. Brilliant. Thank you. Are you it's are true. you just lying to me? No, right I'm, now? I'm actually dead no, serious. Tucker, it, Tucker, is, Tucker, you're right. This could be the greatest book ever. written. I blurbed it. I don't actually. think you know what. I don't think it's just the greatest book ever written. It might be the greatest book that will ever be written. So just stop. Don't even write anymore, people. Put your put your pens down. It ends here. These are my monologues from the five. This is the end of literature. This is the end of literature. But not just my monologues. I add commentary. I t add commentary. So what I'm doing is I'm the first person to rip apart his own book. So where I'm wrong on my monologues, I end up writing why I was wrong. I also update everything. So it's actually two books in one. It's like Retzin. Do you remember Retzin? It's like Reese's. Pe this is a Reese's peanut butter cup. You got peanut butter. And you got chocolate. Are you charging double for it? No, no, I'm not that type of person. I'm a giver, Tucker. Wow, and you also I, uh, quote Nipsey Russell in here. I, I Nipsey which, Russell was uh, is an amazing poet. From he was often on Match Game seventy two to seventy five. An amazing mind. I love rhyming. Rhyming's fun. So if you were to sum up this book in one sentence, or if you were to extract from it its essence, mm. if you were to put it in a garlic press and squeeze hard, what would come out? It's 
a book about how to persuade people and how to and how to be willing to be wrong. This is a book in which I look at my own writing and I see where I persuaded and where I failed. And I just think it's something that can entertain you. And it's you know what? It's a great gift for Father's Day. What's your biggest failure? That was a month ago, so it's a joke. <laughs> I didn't even know that, and I'm a father. Yes, yes, and a terrible one. I'm yeah, mad. apparently. You're an awful father if you don't know father. Well, <laughs> this, is a, this is a great stocking stuffer. No, again, wrong. This <laughs> is, you know what this is? This is, for, Am, for you can go right to Amazon, uh, mm -hmm. though independent booksellers are better. This is a perfect Labor Day gift. It's an amazing Labor Day, it's, or if you're in labor. Yeah, exactly. Well, if you're pregnant and you need something to read and it's a long labor, it's an easy thing to carry this around. This will keep your mind off it. It does. You know, you need that. The Gutfeld monologues. Greg Gutfeld, great to see you, Greg Gutfeld. It's a pleasure, Tucker. Thank Come you. Come by more often. I enjoy your show, too. You're the best part Big of New fan. York. Big fan. <laughs> it's hilarious. <laughs> New research shows that even vegetarian women, vegans, think that meat-eating men are more attractive. Kathy Ruhr, liberal Sherpa does not agree with that. She believes meat is still driving toxic masculinity. She joins us on set with meat in just a minute. Well, vegetarian women may claim to oppose the suffering of animals, and many do, but when it comes to romances, all bets are off. A new study from the University of Padova in Italy finds that when exposed to fictional dating profiles, women are substantially more attracted to men who enjoy eating meat rather than vegetarian options like soup or yogurt or anything soy-based. Kathy Rue is the founding publisher of Catalina Magazine. She is needless to say our liberal Sherpa. She joins us along with several exceptional meats catered tonight by Del Frisco Steakhouse across the street here in New York City, a place you probably don't go. But probably should. So, okay, let's start with the baseline. What would the ideal man eat? Anything. Anything. The ideal man would be confident and proud and able to eat anything. So meat, asparagus, vegetarian, vegan, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. No, so no. if a man were to routinely order a soy-based product. Uh, yeah, women should be okay with that. But the women in the study believe that the men should um, eat meat probably because they believe, they've been conditioned to believe that the men are the hunters of our society and they could provide for them through hunting and therefore over 70, 80,000 years of programming. Uh -huh. They believe that the men have to supply the meat and they don't understand we can love the men for their meat, but we can love them for their asparagus as well. But could it be the opposite? That what? women have been programmed to believe that there are no differences at all between the sexes and it's okay for men to eat tofu. But deep down in their atavistic selves, instinctively, they know that carnivores are probably better providers. Well, in other words, no, they've been no, told by no society study. there's no there's difference. There's no study showing that. No, there's no study. No, I'm Absolutely just, I'm not. just guessing here. I've, I, you know what? I've swerved quite, off right, the beaten path the of science. The opposite, that the studies show that the women believe that the men who eat the meat are the ones that are the but better providers. But why do they believe that is the question. They probably believe they're the better providers because of the hunting societies. There's but, many studies that have come out because of this. There's a, there's a book from 93 that says um, women love meat. And it went back to the hunting society. Right. But that's not something they've yeah. been programmed to believe. That's something right. that's included right. in their genes. Right, which is so genes. sad because the vegans and vegetarians, I mean, every, every man well, out there let's be honest. So you're out provide. to dinner with a man who orders tofu. Then you're out to yes. dinner with a man, and this is all Del Frisco steak, who orders that, the New York Strip. Right. How does that rate? Um, what's the man like? I'm sure the women would appreciate if the man has a great personality, makes them laugh. No, we're going to judge just on the steak. What about a bone-in filet, which is a rarer cut? You don't I mean, a man and his meat are impressive for sure, but I don't think that matters. It's the personality that counts. I okay. think that's... You're okay. trying, and look, you're sticking valiantly to the talking Thank point. You. That's why Thank I'm going to go full... It's not a talking point. No, no, it reality. is. It is. It is. You want to believe that. That's it's, why I'm going no. full thermonuclear on you, okay? No, it's reality. I'm pulling out that, which which is no. a bone-in ribeye. This is really the Cadillac. This is the Bentley yeah. of steaks. Right. A man orders that at dinner, and he doesn't go up at all in your estimation at I all? I don't find you any more attractive holding no, that than, let's, let's, than let's this keep piece this right here. Let's right, just, of course, I'm sorry. Right, objective. because this is scientific. Hey, let's yes. say, a man, yes. okay, right, right, right. orders this, and you don't, part of you doesn't think, you know what, I was kind of on the fence. I like this guy. You, but you're speaking traditional roles, so traditionally no, 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 this no, no, is no, more I'm attractive. Saying, I'm saying, what does your heart tell you? When you see this steak, a man who has the courage, the master, do you say <laughs> to that's toxic that masculinity that or do you say that's the man for me? 
Well, I mean, toxic masculinity is you hurting people with that stake. I mean, becoming toxic. There's nothing. I don't. I think there's we nothing have, more masculine I, about that than holding a carrot that way. Uh -huh, I would yeah. find it just as masculine as male. Yeah, I think our experiment has produced a pretty clear answer, Kathy. Roo, it's what? great to see you tonight. Good to see you and your meat. Tune in every night at 8 to the show that is the sworn enemy of lying, papacity, smugness, and especially groupthink, which is in evidence everywhere now, but we're going to continue to resist it. Good night from New York, Sean Hannity, right now. Hey, Sean. Hey, Tucker, great to see you tonight, and great I to so see you. busted you in front of a group. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know when you got that steak too. It's a you got stolen. that steak from Del Frisco's. Yes, you? I did. All right. Uh, good to see you. Tonight.